Hello, and welcome to Sprott Radio. I'm your host, Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Partner at Sprott Asset Management. I'm pleased today to welcome a new and special guest to our podcast, Stefan Ioano, who joins us today with his PhD in Economic Geology from the University of Toronto and serves as a mining analyst at Comark Securities. Stefan, thank you for joining Sprott Radio. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, Stefan, before we, we dive into today's topic, which is going to be copper, please tell us a bit about yourself as well as your background. Sure. So I've been a, a mining analyst for the better part of about 20 years, originally with Haywood Securities and then moved over to Cormark about seven or so years ago. I did an undergraduate degree in mining engineering and then stuck around in, in, in the university world to do uh, a, a geology degree, a PhD. And, and sort of during that time and shortly thereafter, I worked in Nevada for about four years or four field seasons as an exploration geologist before making the move over to Bay Street and, and getting into the analyst world. Yeah. Must be much nicer being inside in the AC in the summer and in the uh, heat in the winter. I bet. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Let's dive right into it then, because we've seen a nice positive bounce here more recently in copper. So let's talk a bit about copper's pricing in general and what's really driving the most recent bounce that we've experienced. Sure. So, you know, as you know, copper is kind of the, like they say, it's the PhD of the base metals. And and really the primary reason for that is it's, it's just the most widely used. You can find copper in, in almost anything that has anything to do with electronics or motors. And we saw copper hanging around the mid threes to upper threes for the better part of last year and even the year before. You know, it averaged 385 a pound last year. And even through Q1, it was 383 a pound. And then suddenly over the last sort of, you know, several weeks now, it has had quite a jump. And really what kick-started that was actually what I would consider the middleman in the copper space, which is the smelters. And so what happened there was um, a lot of copper smelters, and I'm sure we'll get into it, have been going through a lot of big expansions in anticipation of increased copper demand in the future, uh, largely driven off you know, the electrification of the world. Smelters are big, huge sort of beasts of a machine, and they only really operate it well and optimally when they're full. And so these expansions, namely in China, uh, have been completed recently, and now these smelters are even hungrier than they ever were for what we call concentrates or basically mine production. And again, the smelter takes mine production, they smelt it, and they turn it into refined copper, which an end user or a fabricator would use to make anything from iPhones to Teslas to whatever. Because these smelters have suddenly become more hungry, they've been fighting amongst themselves to secure mine supply to feed their own individual smelters. And in doing so, they've been undercutting each other to the point where the smelting business has become a lot less profitable to maybe even not profitable. And it caused a lot of the Chinese group of smelters to step back and, and sort of talk to each other and say, hey, guys, we got to pump the brakes here and really sort of slow down our hunger in an effort to bring up our profitability. And again, when a mine sells its concentrate to a smelter, um, so they get paid for it, obviously. But in the process, the mine is actually charged what we we call a treatment charge. And that's basically the margin that the smelter is going to make to actually turn that copper into finished refined copper, which it then sells in the open market. Just to put it in context, historically, copper treatment charges, which are usually represented on a, on a, a dollars per ton of concentrate, they were you know, anywhere between 60 and $80 a ton. And over you know the better part of, of this year to date, we've seen them drop down to around $10, $11 a ton. Wow. And there's even some cases down as low as you know three bucks a ton. So you can see all of a sudden how a smelter, which is usually probably the most profitable part of the, the food chain of copper, is now struggling. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot to digest there, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, I don't think anyone would have pointed to the smelters. It sounds like they're smartening up and becoming more the OPEC of the copper industry as far as how they're approaching this, um, mm -hmm. becoming more sophisticated effectively. For so that's, sure. that's fascinating. How sustainable is that then? I mean, given, you know, you mentioned from iPhones to Teslas to everything in between the demand for copper, is this kind of the new normal for these smelters then? Is this going to be the ecosystem they're going to have to operate in going forward? It's the Chinese group right now that's trying to curtail their own buying in it hopes that it brings up treatment charges. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what that's done is caused a whole ripple effect in the, in the space. So the fact that the smelters are now producing less refined copper means that there's less refined copper in the world. And that then to the end users implies there's some scarcity. And so that's really what's driving the price here. And that's why okay. we've seen it jump up to, you know, it's 450 a pound today. That's the one side of the equation, but go upstream and to the mines themselves. And there's also a fundamental issue there, which I think may actually dictate 
to the smelters that they have no choice, that they're going to have to lower treatment charges over the longer term, be less profitable. And that's just because there's a fundamental lack of supply today and even more so in the future as the electrification narrative really takes off. You know, right now, the industry is kind of in supply demand balance, but you know there's some some pretty notable disruptions even in the, just in the last several months. First Quantum's Cobra Panama is probably the the most notable one that people point to. Uh, that was a you know their flagship mine in Panama was basically shut down by the government, and so that mine is no longer producing copper as we speak. And that was one and a half percent of global production. And that's just one of several examples of supply disruptions for geopolitical reasons. Las Bombas in Peru would be another example. There's other issues. We've seen a lot of African copper curtailed as of late, in part due to weather constraints, drought conditions, and, and, and the likes. There's a lot of factors impacting current supply right now. Uh, and then you layer on top of that a really compelling demand increase outlook. And it sort of sets the stage for a perfect storm for higher copper pricing you know, over the next five to 10 years. Well, you know, you mentioned China a couple of times. How important is China to the overall environment of, of copper? Yeah, so it's 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 the biggest player and there's there's sort of two sides to that equation. So China consumes well over half of the world's copper production. Again, a lot of things get made in, in China. A lot of those things require copper. So when you're looking at the tail end of the business, which is refined copper, a lot of the world's smelting capacity is in China and a lot of the end use copper consumption is in China. Again, over 50% on both cases. Unfortunately for China though, they aren't as geologically endowed with copper as some other countries. So in terms of mine production, Chile is by far the biggest producer of copper from the ground. Again, that copper gets turned into concentrate. A lot of it finds its way to China for refining. But again, they have the geology. China doesn't necessarily. And, and, and the way to think of it is, is again, you know, Chile's number one, Peru and, and, and the DRC are kind of fighting for number two. China comes in around three, four, five, you know, sort of in line with the U.S. And, and, and a few other jurisdictions for mine supply. So again, the biggest use of finished copper, user of finished copper, consumer of finished copper, but not the biggest uh, miner of copper. Interesting. Well, you know, when you talk about mines in general, you know, what is the current health of the mining industry? How are these ore grades looking today versus, say, 10 years ago? Well, can you talk a bit about the health of the mining industry today? For sure, yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, when, when, when you have, sort of have that discussion, the, the thing to focus on is the big projects, because those are the ones that really move the needle in terms of supply, demand, fundamentals. And as we look to the big copper projects, and, you know, you'll hear the word porphyry used a lot. These are a, a very classic example of a large style copper deposit that lends itself to huge economies of scale. And what we've seen over the last 10, 20, 30 years is just a steady decline in, in grades of new discoveries. And really, that's just a function of the lowest hanging fruit being picked first. And we're having to look deeper and deeper and in more challenging jurisdictions to really find the next big deposit because the easy ones have been found. And intrinsically, as we look deeper, costs go up. As we mine out the high grade deposits and have to revert to lower grade deposits, the intrinsic cost per pound goes up because it's just a, you know, lower grade. And so what that really translates into is as we need to find more and more copper to, to feed the, the growing demand, we have to turn to lower, more problematic, more challenging deposits, which entail higher costs, which then in, entail higher incentive pricing just to justify building them in the first place. So I think it's that next generation of big mines and their break-even copper price, that copper price is always going up and they're really going to dictate the copper price in the future. Well, as we go into those more challenged geographical locations, as you mentioned, I would suspect that would also probably mean more disruptions. How should we look at that aspect of it as we go into these these parts of the world looking for more copper? Oh, definitely. I mean, it, every jurisdiction is, is, is different. But again, the, when we talk about challenging, um, it can be for a whole plethora of reasons, whether it's like actual physical geography in terms of depth or, or grade of the deposit, but it can also be obviously political is the big one. It can come in two general forms. And the way I think of it is you, know, you can be in a tier one jurisdiction, like even Canada, or the US, but you can still run into a lot of political issues, usually in the form of permitting or very long permitting windows, which can delay projects. Or you can be in 
arguably not tier one jurisdictions where the political risk comes in the form of potential violence or just uh, you know the country taking the deposit back after you've built it. So that kind of volatility as well. Nowhere is perfect from a, a political risk point of view. Some places are better, but they all have their own form of it for sure. How about projects or, or, or discoveries? Anything on the horizon right now, you know, you being plugged into this industry that are worth talking about today? Any new discoveries out there or projects that are up and running that look very promising from a supply standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think the big one on a lot of people's radar, and it's it's not even just one project, it's a district. It's called the Vicuna District. It straddles basically the Argentina and Chile border. Lundin Mining controls probably the key assets in that emerging district. And then there's a few other quote-unquote junior lending group companies with deposits that also feed into that eventual, I think, development strategy. But at the end of the day, it's a very large proposition in terms of, of potential copper output for, for decades and decades and decades. And, you know, you could argue that this is the next Kolawasi in time and, you know, truly world-class. Now, obviously, it's geologically, it's extremely exciting for a lot of reasons. But why hasn't been mined yet or found before? Well, it's at the top of the Andes, straddling a border. Um, infrastructure is very limited at the moment. Again, getting into the risk aspects of it, it's it's project financing, it's political stability, and and just timing to get this thing up into production in a timely fashion. So so stay tuned on it. But it it really does stand to be probably the next great copper district in the world if they can get it off the ground, which they're they're advancing on quite well right now. Just to give our listeners kind of a sense of reality, from the time something's discovered to the time it goes into production or it's in you know, state of extraction, what is a typical time frame that, that people should expect? I know it's probably all over the place depending on a lot of variables, but what, what is a realistic number that people should have in their head? You know, the time from grassroots discovery all the way through to first production. And then the numbers I've seen are, are in the high teens to upwards of 25, 26, 27 years. Wow. Um, so it's a very long window. And, and again, you know, it takes time not only to find a deposit in the first place. Most exploration stories, unfortunately, are failures. You're almost trying to figure out Mother Nature, which is not easy. But even once you find something, you then usually requires multiple seasons or years of drilling to take it to a resource. Then you have to do all the technical work to put a mine plan around that resource. Then you have to permit that mine plan. Then you can think about financing it. And then you have to build it, which is another usually probably at least two year plus in its own right. And then you're finally in production. So people put out these numbers, it takes 25 years. You're like, that's crazy. How can it be? But it, when you start doing the math, it, it adds up pretty quick. Well, it just sounds like the supply demand equation is not going away anytime soon. Then based off less discoveries and in more exotic areas in the world and taking that long of, of amount of time, uh, I suspect this is going to be an ongoing theme as we talk about copper. Definitely. And one thing that really strikes me is I kind of look at the existing supply demand curve for copper. And I, I kind of think of them in projects, I kind of put them in baskets. And if you look at what I'd call the most recent generation of new copper projects, they've all kind of come online more or less now. And they've really helped to keep that supply demand curve in balance. You know, projects like Cobra Panama, which is actually is offline now, but just for example, Cobra Panama, QB2, Kamoa, big projects that have really helped to keep supply up with demand. Um, when I look to the next generation of big projects so that we need, again, to keep things in check, um, especially with the whole EV narrative coming down the pipeline. When I look at that next generation, you know, a lot of them are still in the hands of juniors. The writings on the wall, they just aren't at an advanced enough stage to come into production in time to keep, again, that supply demand in check. You know, a lot of them are at best at a, you know, technical study level. They still face years of permitting and then financing, construction. They're going to need partnerships because these projects are too big for the junior themselves to build. So just a lot of heavy lifting still to be done. And again, that really sets us up for, again, a, a very interesting copper market because demand is coming and the supply doesn't look like it's going to be able to keep up. Well, you know, speaking of juniors and, and speaking of partnerships, are you starting to see more M&A activity pick up in this space then? Yeah, I think so. And I, I anticipate we'll see even more. Part of it is just, again, the timeliness of getting something in production. And so if you're a you know, mid-tier or a major established producer, sure, you can go out and spend lots of money exploring. And some of them do, and some of them are quite successful. But even they know that even if they do that, it's going to be 10 to 15 or, like we said, 25 years before they can actually get that project into production. And especially producers are in, are in the business of cash flow today, not 
you know, 15, 20 years from now. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot more advantageous to maybe pay up for something that is way further down the pipeline of, of potential production or even in production to really bolster near term cash flow as opposed to something that's, you know, going to be 15 years down the road. And, and by the time you do a NAV or, a, you know, discounted cash flow analysis of it, it's basically worth zero anyways today. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking a lot about the supply side. I mean, does recycling play a big role in this from a pricing standpoint? You know, how should we look at recycling as it relates to copper? Yeah, no. So the copper sp- scrap market's a big piece of the equation. It's millions of tons a year. So just to put in perspective, the, the current copper market is kind of call it 25 to 27 million tons a year right now of supply demand. And I'd say a few million tons of that, two, three-ish, are coming from scrap and the rest is coming from mines. The scrap market has an ultimate cap. There's only so, you know, it's a, it's a finite number that's out there. Um, you see more of it show its face when copper prices are higher. People take a bit more time to think about recycling their their scrap when they can get paid more for it. It's sort of human nature. Even so, there's not enough scrap out there to fill the deficit that mines aren't going to be able to make. We've talked a lot about electric vehicles, EVs. How is tech overall playing a role in copper demand? If you can talk about that a little bit, I think so many people think about copper maybe in, in wiring and in plumbing, yeah. but the word tech and copper are being spoken the same sentence more and more yeah. today. Can you, can you spend a little time talking about that? Yeah. So again, I mean, think about the demand right now, again, 25 to 27, call it million tons a year. And when you start to think about the next car that you or I buy will probably be an EV or maybe the car after that, but at some point we'll all be driving EVs. The EV itself, the big focus is on the batteries. Copper's not the, the, the sort of sexy or key component in those batteries itself. That's usually nickel and cobalt and lithium and all that sort of stuff. But when we talk about EVs in the context of copper, we're talking about the charging networks to keep those EVs running. And that requires a, a heck of a lot of copper. And there's also the green energy revolution with, you know, whether it's windmills or solar panels. Again, a lot of copper goes into that sort of infrastructure to, if we are going to go down that road for power. Put it in context, again, 25 to 27 million tons a year right now of demand. Um, when you start to layer in the fact that everyone's eventually going to be driving an EV, we're going to have to charge them all. I think the writing's on the wall that uh, you know you could see upwards of a 25 to to even upwards of 50 percent increase demand for copper over the next five to 10 years. All the while, why supply is shrinking? All the yeah, exactly. And and so okay. there, I mean there there is the uh, there is the investment thesis, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. I guess just to your point on technology, though. That again, that's all sort of EV and wiring and and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But the other sort of even more up and coming area that we're hearing more about is AI. And so that's becoming an interesting thing to wrap your head around with regards to copper demand. And obviously a heck of a lot of computing power is going to be going into to AI in the future. And I just saw a number this morning that, you know, in the next five years, there could be a, a million tons of incremental new copper demand just from AI requirements. So, you know, that's another requirement that we're not seeing from the mines right now. Given all this demand and, and the limited supply, is there anything out there that can replace or complement copper and and what it's currently doing in the environment today from a tech standpoint? Bottom line, the reason why we love copper in in industry is because it's ability to conduct electricity. Mm -hmm. You know, there's very few metals that can actually do it better. Silver is one of them. But as I'm sure you can appreciate, wiring your house with silver wiring would be (laughs) very cost prohibitive. So the next best thing is basically copper. There are a few, but very limited substitutes for copper that could make sense. Aluminum is one of probably the most known or talked about example. Um, You can wire your house with aluminum. It's actually not allowed in, I'm going to say it's illegal in Canada or North America. Reason being is that those wires tend to get very hot and Mm. you end up having fires. There are certain jurisdictions where they actually do do it, but there is a safety hazard around it and hence you don't see it very much. I've got a few other questions, but maybe maybe I'll I'll throw it back to you. Is there anything that I haven't asked yet that you would like to make a point on or any or any concepts or themes that you would like to leave the listeners with? Remembering that the mining cycle from discovery to production, and like we've already touched on, but is a very long-winded process. Uh, it's, it's getting longer and longer every day given issues around political risk and permitting and also just the access to capital. You know, turning on a copper mine is something you can't do overnight. Mm-hmm. And, and meanwhile, in the background, you know, uh, a lot of the people that are going to be relying on copper, i.e. the world's electrification, I don't think quite understand that. The industry in general outside the mining world is, is in for a bit of a rude awakening 
changing, not only with regards to copper, but things like nickel and, and other metals too, critical metals. And so I think there's a, a, a very interesting sweet spot emerging where demand just won't keep up with supply. And, and that's going to be reflected in pricing. You know, Stefan, this is really great. You brought a lot of stuff to light on copper. And I really appreciate you taking the time today. And, and, and hopefully you're open to another conversation later on down the road and, and check in on what's going on with copper and copper equities. Oh, definitely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking part. And, and, and once again, I'm Ed Coyne, and you're listening to Sprott Radio. This podcast is provided for information purposes only from sources believed to be reliable. However, Sprott does not warrant its completeness or accuracy. Any opinions and estimates constitute our judgment as of the date of this material and are subject to change without notice. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This communication is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any financial instrument. Any opinions and recommendations herein do not take into account individual client circumstances, objectives or needs and are not intended as recommendations of particular securities, financial instruments or strategies. You must make your own independent decisions regarding any securities, financial instruments or strategies mentioned or related to the information herein. This communication may not be redistributed or retransmitted in whole or in part or in any form or manner without the express written consent of Sprott. Any unauthorized use or disclosure is prohibited. Receipt and review of this information constitutes your agreement not to redistribute or retransmit the contents and information contained in this communication without first obtaining express permission from an authorized officer of Sprott.